We recently talked about Patrick Williams' contract in comparison to Isaac Okuru, a player that was drafted in his same class. But today's episode, I want to talk about Patrick Williams' contract kind of overall compared to all the restricted free agents passed this year and actually all the free agent deals signed uh, this past offseason as well and how the Chicago Bulls are really investing in the future of Patrick Williams, at least financially. But will they do it on the court? We're going to talk about all that, plus predicting Josh Giddey's extension and the Chicago Bulls have released, or it's been leaked, the City Edition jersey. We're going to talk about all that and more right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host, Ter Hayes, but more importantly, you guys can follow the channel at Bulls Central Pod on every social media platform we happen to be on. With that being said, Let's go ahead and get into this content for today, y'all. And I know I'm wearing green Bulls merch. I have no idea. I just I woke up today in green. I just felt like wearing green. I, yeah, I, 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 I'm uh, got some Irish in my, in my descent, so maybe that was. This is the St. Patrick's Day Bulls stuff, but you know, sometimes you just gotta mix it up. It is what it is. So there you go, Bulls attire. I wanted to wear the green hat. It's the only shirt I have to match it. So you know, it is what it is there. But with that said, I want to start this off by talking about Patrick Williams, picking up on kind of something we talked about before in regards to Patrick Williams. And the Isaac Okoro, uh, you know, contracts and how that matches. And, you know, in that, I said that, you know, yeah, Isaac Okoro got less, but Patrick Williams is a better player. I, you know, I, I have no doubts about that. But when you look at the other players from his class, right, let's, let's go and look at that when it comes down to it. So Tyrese Maxey signed for five years, $203 million. Emmanuel quickly for five years, $162 million. Patrick Williams comes in at third on that list for five years, $90 million. Obi Toppin with four years. $58 million, and Aaron Wiggins with four years, $45 million. That's the top five uh, restricted free agent contracts signed this past offseason. So Patrick Williams sits right there at number three, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. Him signing the third highest deal amongst, uh, you know, amongst uh, restricted free agents, it kind of makes some sense when you factor in the youth, when you factor in the fact that he got the full five-year deal as well, which, uh, you know, the top three there, of course, uh, Maxi. Uh, quickly and Patrick Williams all signed five-year deals the other two signed uh, four-year deals so it makes sense he's a, he's a he's a modern forward right that can play either forward position he's going to be a power forward for the Chicago Bulls you know long term he may move back to the three depending on what Modest Busilis turns into eventually but I even think Modest Busilis is probably going to play the three more three maybe his first couple of years in the league and then eventually move over to that when you look at the total value of Patrick Williams deal as well he got more money than an Isaiah Hartenstein, even though Hartenstein got got eighty seven million dollars over less years, over three years, whereas Patrick Williams got ninety million over five years. He got more than Malik Monk. Malik Monk signed for four years, seventy eight million, and Demar Derozan signed for three years, seventy four million dollars. When it comes down to it, as well. But when you look at the the number, the the annual uh, average salary, right? That's that's what it comes down to as well. You want to factor that in to give the complete color on that. Patrick Williams signed for the 15th largest deal in, in free agency this year. When you, when you look at the average annual salary of him coming in at $18 million, it actually puts him less than Malik Monk, less than KCP, Nick Claxton, DeMar DeRozan, Miles Bridges, and Tobias Harris all got more annually than what Patrick Williams got when you look at that, uh, that breakdown of it. Now, when you look at just the, the overall money, though, the overall money on the contract, uh, Patrick Williams signed the eighth largest contract this free agency when you include unrestricted free agents at $90 million. So, um, again, uh, you know, Patrick Williams, the, the investment that the Bulls made, while this can very well be a deal that Patrick Williams outshines, I want to be clear that he very well could make this contract look like a value contract as soon as this season, right? If Patrick Williams, to me, comes in and he averages, I know I always go to that December, but if he is anywhere between 14 to 16 points per game this year, he does it on efficient shooting and brings the defense that we've seen from Patrick Williams that he can be over his career. That that's again, that's more than worth it when you look at some of the deals that were given out. Like, yeah, Patrick Williams got more money than Clay. He got more money than Obi Toppin. He got more money than Isaac Okoro. He got more money than Isaiah Joe. I'm not mad at that. He got more money than Mo Wagner, right? As far as annual, but um, that's because of the investment that that the Bulls are placing in Patrick Williams. On top of the Bulls realizing that they are going younger with their roster, and at some point, Zach. Pooch, Torrey Craig, those guys could all be off the roster. It could be. I'm, I'm Again, at this point, I'm not thinking anything's a foregone conclusion with the Bulls making it deal or not. 
but it is a possibility for that to happen. And, you know, to bring this home, more than the focus on the contract aspect of it, it is the investment that the Bulls have made in Patrick Williams because you look at how the Bulls have handled restricted free agency before. Kobe and Io got three-year deals, right? Laurie Marketing got traded when he was a restricted free agent. The Bulls didn't even want to really even explore that. Like, you know, they tried. They offered him a contract. It didn't get to where they wanted it to. They ended up trading him, right? The Bulls made a full five-year investment on Patrick Williams. And I think, you know, when you look at it, you can't base that off just the production that he's done so far in his career because that 10 points per game, while really good on the efficiency from three-point range, you can find other players that can maybe even give you a little bit more in the same amount of shots, but it's them investing in still who they think Patrick Williams can be. Now, some more pessimistic Bulls fans are going to look at that and say, well, they just don't, they don't want to admit that they were wrong on drafting Patrick Williams fourth overall. And maybe there is a little bit to be said in that. But Patrick Williams is a player that just turned 23 a couple of, a few weeks ago, less than a month ago, he turned 23 years old. And now you have him locked in until basically his 28-year-old season. That's throughout a, a, the, a, the large part of what his prime should be, right? And so that's what the investment that the Bulls are making. The question is, and the same question that I presented with Kobe White when I said that the Bulls have been pushing Kobe White more so as the face of the team when you look at how they've been using him in marketing material, things like that. But the, the question is, is that is that investment now going to be more on the court for Patrick Williams? Me and Steve will talk about Patrick Williams over on Locked on Bulls. I'm not going to rehash that conversation. But for Patrick, to me, it's more about him being more aggressive, him attacking closeouts, him attacking and going after offensive boards, getting putbacks, things like that. Just doing those things can put him from being a 10-point-per-game score right up to a 14-point-per-game score. But still, some players, you do need to make sure they're involved in the offense. You need to call plays for those guys. And once they feel, once they get kind of – in that rhythm of being a little bit more involved, you see them step their game up, and maybe Patrick Williams is a little bit like that as well. So I think the Bulls have to do a mixture of both. Moving the ball around a lot more could, could open up more opportunities for Patrick. He just has to stay active and move around. Having a point guard like Josh Giddy out there, him being more active, him moving around, that's going to be a big part of that, right? And I think ultimately when it comes down to it, it just is Patrick Williams has to come into training camp, A, and shows that he wants, right? Patrick Williams has to come in and show like, now, Patrick Williams, you're no longer just the kid. Yeah, you're 23 years old, but you're moving and going into your fifth season in the NBA. Fifth. And while two of those seasons were shortened dramatically by major injuries, you're still in your fifth year. You've been working with NBA uh, trainers. You've been working. You've been playing against NBA players. You've been doing all this now for five years, going and coming into your fifth season. It's time, right? And not to say that Patrick Williams has, it doesn't still have time to continue to round out his game and add to his game. He absolutely does. Told you guys, I'm not like some Bulls fans or some sports fans where I look at a player and I'm ready to write them off as a bust when it comes down to it. But when you look at it, Patrick Williams has made only 3.7 shots per game for his, per game for his career. For his career. He's only averaged taking eight of those. That's still a really good percentage. He's averaging making 46% of his shots, basically 47% of his shots. You just got to take a little bit more. And you can naturally get those by being a little bit more aggressive. And I'm not saying anything that people don't know, right? But the Bulls also have to be invested in this. And having Dan Craig, having um, Wes Unsell Jr., having these guys who have developed guys before, hopefully that helps Patrick Williams some as well. But you got to invest in them on the court. And, you know, some through some of that investment also has to come that you got to show us that you're ready for what we're ready to invest in you but Pat got to step his game up, right? And I know some people are going to say, well, Hayes, put him back at the three. Uh, you know, I, like I've said before, the way that Billy Donovan uses the three and the four, they're basically interchangeable. And the way that the league is going is that the three and the four is basically used interchangeably. At this point, he's guarding either position, right? So that's going to be there for him regardless. He's going to be guarding uh, either position. And, you know, that, that just is what it is, right? But Patrick Williams, when it comes down to it, he has to show that, in my opinion, that he wants it. And if he does then, all right, the opportunity is going to be there for him. The fact that he is now going to be out there with two ball-handling guards, two players that are pretty good at at, at ball-handling. We've already talked about Kobe White and how, as an assist man, right, as an assist man, um, he grew a lot last season. As far as in the clutch as well, he was one of the better assist players. I think he was second in the league in clutch assists. And we already know what Josh Giddey can be as far as setting, setting people up. You just have to want it. You have to want it. And that's up to Patrick Williams, man, to show that he that he wants that, that he's ready for it, and that he's going to be playing, uh, you know, to that level. And you know, Patrick Williams, is a player that when you look at the the breakdown, 
almost half his, his time playing, even in his rookie year, was at the power forward. 91% his second year at power forward. 90% his third year at power forward. 95% last year at power forward. 3% of those were at, was, was at the center, weird, weirdly enough, right? Um, so how, how Patrick Williams is used is hugely important as well. And shout out to my boy, Winton, who's been, you know, anytime Patrick Williams has come up lately, he's been, uh, he's been, you know, mentioning the fact that, you know, Patrick Williams has to be utilized better. And I, I think pair that with the mentality for Patrick Williams has to be better as well. But yeah, you got to use your players to their strengths. And that's one thing that I have always criticized Billy Donovan with, not even just with Patrick Williams, with Zach Levine, like Zach Levine is one of the better catch and shoot players in the NBA. We don't run very many catch and shoot opportunities for him, right? Those type of things. That has been a thing around Billy Donovan since he's been here with the Bulls. So overall, the Bulls did invest in Patrick Williams. And when you kind of look at where he ranks in the league, the fact that he signed one of the one of the higher deals in the league, as far as all the deals signed by unrestricted free agents this offseason per annual salary, he was third highest in, in restricted free agents this year. Like Patrick Williams got got the bag compared to the players around him. Now it's up to Patrick Williams to show that he deserves that and to, and to live up to that. And like I said, he could very well make this deal look like a steal when it's all said and done. But in talking about one player with the Bulls that has already gotten extended, to talking about the next one who's up for an extension, that's Josh Giddy. Now, Bleacher Report was doing a prediction uh, article on restricted free agents, uh, upcoming restricted free agents, and what their deals could be. Now, they also mentioned in this, which I'll get into towards the end here, that there's a chance that the Bulls extend him before the start of the season. I'll talk about that here in a second. But so just to break down the numbers, uh, Josh Giddy currently has a salary of $8.4 million. Uh, when you look at it as well, he has a cap hold next season of $25.1 million. Uh, they have the, re the realistic floor of his next deal being $18 million. I think if the Bulls can get Josh Giddy locked into $18 million, that's damn near a steal of a deal. Personally, that's in my personal opinion. They put the ceiling at Josh Giddy's contract at $25 million uh, uh, per year on that annual average salary. The market value for Josh Giddy, they have it at $20 million. So when you look at that, that contract area that they have Josh Giddy in, if you're looking at between $22 and $25 million, that would put Josh Giddy around the same salaries of uh, Clint Capella, Dylan Brooks, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, KCP, what deal he signed, uh, Bruce Brown as well, making $23 million per year, Mikel Bridges, Kyle Kuzma, DeMar DeRozan, Terry Rozier, Jalen Brunson, right? Jalen Brunson there. So the thing is, is that this Bulls team, and I, and I say all this to say this, if, Jaylen, if, if Josh Giddey signs a $25 million annual average value salary for, with the Chicago Bulls on his contract extension, it be, you better goddamn well believe that he's going to be the one to run your offense for the, for the majority of that contract. And not to say that's not even a huge deal in modern basketball. It's not, it's not a crazy deal anymore in, in with the contracts that are given out. But the thing is, is that part of the reason why you pivoted from the version of the team that you had, and the reason why I highlight that, look at DeMar DeRozan making slightly over $23 million per year. You, you, you moved off that to gain you more flexibility, but also in the sense that rather than paying an over 34-year-old player that much, you're paying a 22-year-old player that much, right? So there's a very big difference as far as age. Age plays a factor in the value of your contract as well because you're fact trying to factor in how much this player can grow over that, that contract also. And so that part plays a huge part in that for, for Josh Giddy as well. So here's the thing. And, you know, in the end of this article, they mention the fact that it, it's something that the Bulls could extend Josh Giddy before the start of the season. And we've heard no noise on that. None. We've heard basically none on that, that the Bulls could extend Josh Giddy. They would have to do so, I believe, before the start of the regular season if they don't. They can't extend them during the season. It would have to be at the end of the season. Now, that's how the Bulls have typically done their restricted free agents. They didn't extend Kobe. They didn't extend Io. They didn't extend Patrick Williams the season prior to the becoming restricted free agents. They waited until that offseason. Basically, in a, in a lot of ways, making that last year kind of a prove it of, all right, like prove what your, what your upside and value is, and we'll pay you based off that. Now, in the case of Kobe White and Io DeSumo, they ended up very, very well showing in those first years after signing it that, uh, yeah, those were still of deals. Those are going to be great value deals that the Bulls are going to have those guys on. Patrick Williams could very well do that this season as well. We just talked about that. The question with Josh Giddy is, is that with Josh Giddy coming into a role where he's going to be theoretically, right, based off the, the idea right now, we don't know for sure, 
He's going to be playing a role that's better suited to his skill set, that's better suited for him to be closer to that 17, 8, and 6 guy that he's going to, you know, theoretically be closer to that. Would it benefit the Bulls to, to sign Josh Giddy before the season? Now, I don't think it's going to happen. I, w- I want to be very clear here. I think it's very unlikely that Josh Giddy signs a contract extension before the start of the season. I think it's unlikely. But if AK were to do that, it would be one of the more forward-thinking moves that AK has made in his tenure here with the Chicago Bulls. And the reason why I say that is that if you feel confident, if you truly feel confident that a player is going to shine in your system and you think you're going to put them in an optimal role to where he can be maybe even demand the max level contract extension, if you're able to sign him for less than that and it ends up paying off during the season, it's a great forward thinking move. Now, it's a risk with that because let's say the Bulls go ahead and lock Josh Giddey in to 19 to $22 million contract, right? Less than that 25 that he can make, but between 19 and 22 million, right? If Josh Giddy comes in and this, this season looks like an absolute disaster for him, it blows up in your face. If he starts at, at the, over the course of the 2024-25 season, Josh Giddy shines. He averages 17, 8, and 6 and gets triple doubles and things like that. Then you look like a very smart front office that you locked him in to deal before he came in and absolutely shined and hopefully meshed well with your players. But there's a risk involved in that. And with the way that the things have worked for the Bulls, when they take risk, they very rarely work for this team, right? So I want to pit, I want to throw this to you guys, right? You can call in for the voicemail on it. You can leave it in the comment section. If you want it read on the mailbag, if you leave it on the comment section on YouTube, just type mailbag before you, you leave it. That way I can filter the comments. Uh, trying to get back to that, filter the comments and pull it for the mailbag. But let me know what you guys think. Do you think the Bulls should be looking to extend Josh Giddy before the start of the season? And then, I mean, at that point, if he does play bad, you're kind of locked in with him. Or do you think they should wait? Let him prove it over the course of the season. And then, hell, if he proves it and he's worth the max money, you play, you pay a player that you feel has earned a max contract, if that's what him and his agent deserve. I mean, well, demand. Let me know what you guys think of that. Like I said, it's it's. I know people are going to lean one way or another, and that may be based off how you feel about Josh Giddy as a player right now. But kind of thinking more about it in the sense of how it could affect the franchise's flexibility going forward let me know what you guys think on that down below with that said we have another article on four teams that could trade for Nikola Vucevic I want to touch on this really quickly before we get into the uh city edition jersey talks um but this was an article written by Pippet ain't easy take that for what you will but they have four teams that could call on Nikola Vucevic over the course of the NBA season and I actually agree with most of these teams of course first they have the New Orleans Pelicans we've talked a lot about the Pels and how um Nikola Vucevic could make sense for them over the course of the season. They don't have a center. Their, their young center that they drafted in Eve Missy, who actually liked in that, in that draft, I think he's got hurt. So there's some doubt on how much he's going to start, how raw he's going to be even with that. And then it's Daniel Tice, right? That's why we've heard rumors that Zion could even play some center for the New, the New Orleans Pelicans next season because they just don't have it. So that makes sense. They don't have, the, the, don't have a center there. They have contracts that they can move. They can end up bringing in Nikola Vucevic. They have some defense around him. Maybe they feel confident in it. So there you go, right? There, there you go. The Pelicans, they make sense because of those reasons. I have whole videos on it. I'm not going to touch a lot on it. The next one is the New York Knicks. Now, the Knicks are an interesting uh, case study here, right? The Knicks have Mitchell Robinson. Tom Thibodeau has recently talked about the fact of that they're going to do center by committee. Jericho Sims is going to play some center for them. Precious Achua is going to play some center for them. So they're going to do it by committee. But if they get towards the season, and they figure out Julius Randle probably is going to play some small ball center for them as well. If the, if the Knicks get to a place where they have this team, they have so much great spacing on that team with all the perimeter players that they have there, that's something that Vooch could thrive in offensively. But the defensive aspect, Tom Thibodeau is a defensive-minded head coach. He would be absolutely pissed off by, by some of the, the missed assignments that Nikola Vucevic is going to have in pick and rolls and things like that. They also have built this really switchable team. Having Nikola Vucevic there for the New York Knicks affects that switchability because Vooch can't switch on shit, right? So that's where you run into it when it comes down to Nikola Vucevic. I don't think he makes a lot of sense for the Knicks. So I, d- I don't think, I mean, it's just looking at a team that needs a center, sure. But I think that they maybe could call on some other centers before they call on Nikola Vucevic, who really doesn't make sense for exactly what. Yes, they need a center, but they need a shot blocking, rim running, that type of center. Vooch ain't that. Next up, the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, the Lakers are one of these teams where they can always make a move, and sometimes it doesn't always make sense. 
When you look at the fact that Anthony Davis, he just doesn't want to play center. That's just what it comes down to. He doesn't want to play center. They have contracts that they can move there, um, that, they can, that they can try to bring Nikola Vucevic to AD. And I think the defensive player that AD is, maybe there's some, some conversation to be had there on that can be something that they can work with. So the Lakers, I can see them potentially being a team to call on Nikola Vucevic. Now, they're matching the $20 million. It would take multiple players. The Bulls don't have multiple spots. So that would mean that either another deal would have to happen, right? So let's say that the Bulls do move on from Zach, or they do move on from a Tory Craig or whatever else, and they get less contracts back within the Tory Craig move. Maybe you're getting a, a deal that you can waive, maybe a non-guaranteed or something like that. Um, then maybe the Lakers can be an option there. But, you know, look out for something. Maybe, maybe the Lakers also would want Tory Craig as a veteran piece that can come in and play off their stars. I didn't think about that at first. And then lastly, they have the Golden State Warriors here. Now, the Warriors are an interesting case as well because the Warriors are this team. They re-signed Steph. They still have Dre there. Are they going to be trying to compete? Or are they kind of just, you know, waiting to see? There's been some rumors maybe they could look to move Steph. I don't believe that. But they have Trace Jackson Davis. They're a player that I actually like at center for the makeup of that team. But, you know, does Vooch and, Dr- and Draymond work together? Or Dre being at the four and and Vooch being at the five, is that some potential there? It really depends on if the Golden State Warriors want to make a win-now move during the season because they think that they can actually make a move towards maybe being trying to compete and get out the West again, which I don't necessarily see happening for that team. But you guys can let me know what you guys think on all that down below, as always. But let's get into the thing that I wanted to end this show with. I honestly probably should have started the show off with this one. Uh, probably would have been better clickbait for the title uh, of the, uh, for the for the video, but you guys know I really don't like doing clickbait anyway. So that take that for what for what it is. Um, but with that said, uh, the the city edition jerseys have reportedly leaked. I'm going to put the one up here on the screen now. Uh, they all all teams have reportedly leaked, but the Bulls. We're a Bulls podcast. We're going to focus on the Bulls. And the Bulls going here with a more white and I guess that's gold. Looking at this. I'm not mad at it. I like the City Edition jerseys being something different, right? When we had the, the white and powder blue Bulls jerseys that were mainly white with the trim being powder blue, I love those. I don't hate this jersey. Now, the thing with it is, is that I need to see the full uniform, personally. I like to see it with the shorts to see how they match. If you pair this as well with the Chicago Bulls, um, you know, the leaked image, it seemed like that maybe there were some swirls on the, on the shorts there that maybe kind of bring the design a little bit more together. I do like that they have the stars there on the side of the jersey, as you guys can see there as well. I think that the the lettering on the chest, the bulls on the chest, I wish that would have been a little bit bolder, right? As far as standing out a little bit more, especially on a white jersey, it looks kind of muted there, but I don't hate this City Edition jersey. I actually think it looks pretty damn good if I'm being 100% honest with you. Like, again, I need to see the full uniform to see how I feel about it overall, but I don't hate this as something different for, for the Bull City. I wonder, because remember last season, the in-season tournament, every um, team had a custom court, and it went with the in uh, with the uh, the city edition jerseys. I would be really interested to see what the the, the in-season tournament court is going to look like with a design like this. Is going to be mainly white with gold. That kind of pops to me. So overall, I don't hate this jersey at all. I don't hate it. But let me know what you guys think on that. Like, do you like the jersey? Do you dislike it? Do you want, wish they would have went with some more traditional kind of Chicago Bulls colors? moving away from the black and red over the last couple of seasons. Let me know what you guys think on that. I, I, I like it. I like I for the most part. If it comes in a world to where you have to say whether you hate it or like it, I like it. I like it a lot, actually. So let me know what you guys think on that down below. That's my time for today. Make sure you guys are following the show at Bull Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns. BullCentralPod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the mailbag, the number to do so, 773 773- 270-2799. We are the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related, but that's thanks to you guys. And like I liked in every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See red if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of the Break Break Media. Break, break, media. media.